with this Zoom thing, it looks much better than uh, with uh, uh, with TeamViewer before. Can you all hear my voice? I guess you could. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, so first of all, let's uh, let me share a little bit. Let me walk you through the uh, the software a little bit. So right now, so I'm gonna stop the acquisition, and uh, I'm gonna go to the technical manager. Okay, let me walk you through real fast, you know, like the software. This is uh, uh, GMS3. I guess all of you are um, probably familiar with this, uh, with this uh, software, but let me just uh, walk you through real fast. So we, this is a software that we launched uh, back in 2015, I think, 2014, I remember. I think it was 2014. And, uh, you know, we have two different sections. So one is uh, the microscope, set, the instrumental section, everything that is related to the instrumentation is on the left side. So you can tell now the microscope is in uh, STEM mode. So you can see that the probe here, we can uh, open the valves, uh, lift up the screen. So if we click uh, the button uh, here, so you're actually um, uh, lowering the screen. So the screen is down, so the beam, the screen is not blocking uh, the beam. The beam doesn't go to the camera here. So you can control the uh, detectors here. So we're gonna be using uh, the ADAP detector here you have two different detectors that you can use. So we're gonna be, if you click on that one of two, you can, uh, you can say, okay, I'm gonna select uh, the ultra scan. So right now the ultra scan is selected. Um, so this is the CCD camera with, uh, with the scintillator. So I'm gonna be starting from F10. So essentially we're doing some sort of uh, F10 with, um, um, you know, in the scanning mode, okay? We're using the ultra scan here. Um, and you know you can also click here and insert a slit if you want and do some sort of energy filter diffraction. But you know if, if you were in TM mode, we would have, we would have be able to do any F10 here. And, you know you have some functionality here. But everything that is related to the instrumentation is on the left side. But using it, it's using a 37 meter, uh, 37 millimeter camera lens. Now under the Technics Manager, uh, what we have, we have everything that we need to run the experiment. So if you're interested in TM imaging. Click TM imaging, and you, this is all you need for TM imaging. Okay, you have view, you have capture, that's all you need. Um, STEM SI, we're going to be doing a lot of STEM SI, so STEM spectrum imaging. So you click in there, and software is telling us which tool is small. We tell no, because you know, we want to, I want to show you a few things first. Um, so then uh, you have the first portion is uh, basically related to uh, the scan, so you control uh, the beam. The second, uh, the second portion is SI acquisition, spectrum imaging acquisition. This is what is used to uh, set up your uh, spectrum imaging experiment. This is the camera. Um, you know, if you want to take an image, yeah, you can do that. Um, actually, I tried to do like uh, the experiment that you know Dave uh, was suggesting that we'll do like uh, in a second. Uh, and then we have EOS here. Right now we are in F10 mode, so the EOS portion is grayed out. And then also these are the features that, I mean, these are functionality that is used to, to quantify the data, okay? All right, so you can do like uh, in the software, uh, if I go on, uh, uh, right now the beam is sitting right in the center, but if you go on a spot mode, you can actually move the beam or whatever you want, okay? So you can do search or preview, if you want to do record an image, you can do capture. If you want to change things, you can go there and that will look the same as the old software. Okay, very good. So first uh, first thing, uh, let's try to acquire an image. Um, so you don't see anything because the screen is down. And it's actually the good thing of here is very intuitive, especially for uh, novices because you know, you see that they're supposed to use this detector but there's no electrons are going down. So you know there's a screen. You know, witness a lot of like uh, silly mistakes. So right now we are scanning, but if you have the spot mode enabled, uh, it will tell you that once I stop the acquisition, the beam is going there. Or, you know, if you want to move it to another area or you want to move it here, you stop the beam and the beam is going right there. So this is actually very useful, the park position, because, uh, you know, you know where the beam is going once you uh, stop the acquisition. Okay, so let's uh, put the beam here on, uh, on, uh, on the amorphous material. I want to show you one thing. So you stop the acquisition here. So now the beam is parked uh, on, uh, um, on the amorphous material, the platinum carbide here. Um, and, um, and so you've gone view here. Oh, let me see, let me 
Uh, you can change the bin. So this I'm actually using the ultra scan now. So let's look at our prop here. Okay, so this is our prop. You want to see the collection angle. That's very easy. So it's just because we don't have enough uh, contrast right now. So you can actually play with the gamma here. Okay, now you see this. Uh, uh, now you see the uh, the edge of uh, the aperture here. This is the the in the the, the entrance aperture of uh, the ELSO spectrometer. Um, I can move the beam here on uh, on uh, on the sample. So you see the uh, you see actually you can see uh, how in zone is. You see this is a nice stereo zone, but you see that is the sample is out of zone down there. So you can look at this one here. I mean I can have the beam. Uh, Part uh, here, you can even insert uh, insert a slit if you want. Uh, we can try to insert a slit now. Uh, obviously, you don't see anything because probably the slit is on the way. Um, yeah, so you see a little bit the slit. So ideally, what you want to do, you can uh, you want to go up in energy. Okay, so um, I mean, there's a functionality to uh, correct for the slate, but you know, this is uh, let's see. Okay, so you can say this is a, with a slick team. This is with a slick dial. So you see, like a, a boost in. Uh, Oh, it went down to so we would have to uh, basically like uh, uh, correct the position of uh, of the sleep. But, you know, you see a little bit of boosting. Here. Okay. Um, what we have to do in general is uh, when you've done the amorphous material, is actually to uh, um. Let me go back. Oh, that's fine. So it's basic over here. You can show them how to quickly measure the alpha beta width. Oh yeah, it was uh, the one thing that you could do when you're here. If you go through focus, you could go through focus. You can actually do astigmatism, and uh, you can work your Ronchi gram in this camera length. Normally, this is uh, uh, this is possible. I mean, you could tell uh, going through the uh, the Ronchi gram. Um, you could tell that uh, you know the, the obviously like Robert uh, lined the microscope, so this is pretty good. Um, but you know you could do the ronchi gram uh, with this camera length. The advantage uh, we're using the camera at the end of the GIF. The advantage uh, here is uh, that we are aligning our microscope using uh, the conditions uh, that are used uh, for EOS. So you know with the short camera length. Now the short camera length is important because um, we the short camera length is important because we want to make sure to have a large collection angle. So the smaller the camera length is. The larger this collection angle is. Now we want to measure the, our collection angle. That's very easy to do. So we stop the camera here, and then uh, you go to microscope here, and you say, "Okay, I want to do calibrate the image." Now you could calibrate the image in a lot of different ways. So the easiest way, in my opinion is uh, because we know our convergence angle. So this is our convergence angle. This is actually twice our convergence angle. So you draw like an area, it's like a diameter here, from one to the other one, say okay. So what's what's our convergence angle, Robert? 10.3 So let's type in the radians. And you said that it's uh, 10.3, so it's gonna be, 20 point, uh, this is twice the convergence sum. Okay. So the caveat here is that you know your convergence angle. So we, if you don't know how to measure your convergence angle, we can talk about that later. But yeah. if, you, if you have an accurate convergence angle, then. Yeah, this is actually a very like a rough, uh, it's not rough, actually, that's a good estimate of you, but it's based on your convergence sum. This is your, your prop, okay? Um, now you want to measure your collection angle. So we calibrated the image based on uh, the convergence angle. So right click, go to this guy here, just say uh, line with length label. 
So you draw like a line from here to here across um, uh, in our cycle. It says 75.16. You have to divide this by two because it's a semi-angle. So it's about uh, 38, uh, 38 milliradian. So right now we are working with a 10 milliradians convergence angle and with a 38 milliradians uh, collection angle. That's a, that's a very easy way of measuring uh, uh, the collection angle. Um, but you know you need to have a GIF uh, because you have to be able uh, to make sure that the beam is in uh, is in the center. Actually, Robert, what you can show them is uh, because right now everything is perfectly aligned. But sometimes when you change the camera length, try to change the camera length to yeah. know, maybe 50 millimeters or 90 millimeters. Well, we'll just it it'll move as soon as I. I yeah, yeah, I, that's yeah, that's the whole point. So now he changed uh, the camera length. So now look at this. Now the bright spot is in a different position. So the uh, one of the reasons why you want to, you know, the importance of GIF is actually you can make sure that you know the beam is uh, is always crossing the center of uh, of the aperture. So ideally, with the diffraction alignment, uh, you can move the beam uh, to the center. So Robert is going back to 37 millimeter. Now you see that the beam is going right at the center of uh, the spectrometer entrance aperture, and you can actually use that uh, to um, align your microscope. A lot of people don't believe that. Uh, actually, mostly that the microscope vendors, uh, you know, don't believe that when you change the camera length, you actually affect a little bit the alignment of uh, of the microscope uh, to some extent. And in the case of uh, uh, atomic EOS, you're trying to maximize uh, everything, your probe size and the probe current, so little changes can um, uh, make the difference. Um, so it's important actually to align your, if you're doing like EOS stem, you want to align your probe, you want to correct your probe with the same condition you're using for EOS. So the only way you could do that is uh, actually using the GIF and using the GIF camera. Okay, that's very good. Now, one of the things that uh, my advisor told me a long time ago is that every time you look across, and you know, Dave knows my, my professor in uh, back in Glasgow very well. Um, every time you go across an interface, every time you, you want to look at an interface, you always want to make sure that you're going across the interface. Now, we have a functionality with uh, you know, GMS3. So you can right click, um, draw like a line. So this is my interface here. and tell the software to align this vertically. So now we're going across uh, the, uh, the interface. The reason why you wanna go across the interface, because for a given amount of time, you're gonna be depositing uh, less charge. So it's a little bit better for, uh, um, it's a little bit better for, uh, for your material. Also, you can always convert um, um, one, um, two D box into one D box, but essentially it's a little bit, um, better for your sample if you actually go across the interface. If you're interested in interface, because if you go like this, a lot of people, uh, when they look at interface, they have their sample aligned like that, so aligned horizontally. So when you go like this, you always scan from left to right. So if you're interested in interface, you're going to be depositing a lot of charge along the interface. But if you go, if you go across the interface, You're gonna be giving. You're gonna be giving the, the sample time to recover from, uh, you know, from the interaction with the electron. So this is a, this is my recommendation if you're looking at interfaces. You can always uh, rotate everything back in uh, via software after the data is acquired. Okay. So what we do now, uh, we switch to EOS. We want to start with the K2, right? That's very easy to do. So let's select uh, the K2 first. So the software automatically will load the, the alignment for the K2. Let, let me let me just look at, to all the users out there. We don't normally want to start with the K2. Let's always start with the US 1000. But for this demo for, for Palo, it's it's okay to start with the K2. So I can tell you. Uh, let me give you. Let, let me tell you one uh, quick story. So we 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 sold. Uh, I think free data detection system to the semiconductor company in Korea. And there are uh, people uh, 
um, and there are actually two systems like this one here. And there are uh, most of the microscopies that were hired uh, within uh, the last year. They never really used uh, the UltraScan. They always they only use the K2. So they learn E also with the K2. So you could do you could use the K2. Uh, actually, once you start using the K2, you'll be using the K2 all the time. I can tell you that because you know, the quality of the data is much better. So no, we. I, I just meant from a, a safety standpoint and a learning standpoint, but it's it's okay. This uh, you know the technology implemented the K2 and the K3 is super safe because uh, the fin you have a fin layer and the whole point of that is you want the electrons to get through completely. So it's uh, really difficult to damage uh, um, you know the detector to damage the K2 because the electronics is also separated from the sensor. So it's uh, it's very it's very safe. Uh, it is uh, you won't be damaging the K2. And okay. you know you cannot if you deposit too much charge in uh, in the in uh, in the sensor, you can anneal overnight and then take another gain. So you're good with that. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's look at the zero loss peak first. Okay, so we talked about this. Okay, EOS here. So now we have a K2 inserted, and um, unfortunately with the K2 we have only uh, single ring, so we don't have to use. But something that you have to remember, this is the only thing that you have to remember. Um, so when you type a zero here, you want to make sure so that like, you have duty cycle uh, zero of 0 0.041. Now let me explain a little bit what this duty cycle is. Because we are uh, collecting the dating counting mode, and the K2, I think, is able uh, to count uh, uh, up to 20 electrons per second per pixel uh, before uh, you get something called the counting losses. So the meaning of counting loss, uh, this, uh, this is not uh, damaging or it's not saturating the detector. But counting losses means that the same electrons is now counted twice, OK? Because what happened is uh, that uh, you're getting too many electrons, and the camera is not fast enough uh, to uh, read out uh, or to distinguish each single electron. So the, sec the same electron can be read out twice. So that's the problem. And if the dose is too high, that happens. Now, the implication in the also spectrum is that now you lose energy resolution. And if you keep going with, uh, you know, with uh, increasing the dose, you know, the zero loss peak, for example, is going to be like uh, bigger and bigger. And at some point, it will go like uh, horizontal just because, you know, you're, uh, you're getting uh, you're not able to distinguish electrons anymore. So now with the duty cycle, uh, what you do, you control uh, the electrostatic shutter, which is, is sitting, um, the electrostatic shutter is sitting right here, you know, right below uh, the entrance aperture and the ADAF detector. And it will be used uh, to dim uh, the, uh, to dim uh, the, uh, the intensity, okay? So now we're dimming uh, the intensity. Uh, it doesn't matter which exposure time you take because this is uh, this is a direct detection. So direct detection, what happens is that the, uh, you um, you always read out the, uh, the the camera always read out at the same speed. It doesn't matter the exposure time that you're putting there. The camera will always run uh, 400 frames per second. So if you put zero point 400 frames per second, if you put like which correspond to 2.5 milliseconds. So if you have an exposure time of uh, 50 milliseconds, means that the output that you see here is basically the sum of, uh, what would it be like 20, 20 images. So I'm doing now, I'm collecting now a zero loss peak with 50 milliseconds. This is totally different from uh, the ultra scan. This is why I'm telling you that it's more safe uh, with, the, with the K2 because uh, you can use, as long as your duty cycle is zero, I can even use an exposure time of 0.2. And you're not saturating. Or even 0.5. Can you do 0.5 second exposure time with the ultra scan? No. Because you read out, uh, the, the way you read out the data is different. So let's stop uh, the beam here. So that, this is actually clear here. Let me put this guy in the center. Okay. Oh, sorry. 
So first thing that you do, you want to bring the, uh, the zero loss peak to zero. So right now we are not scanning, the bib is inviting. Click on the align zero loss peak, this goes to zero. Uh, it's probably off power just due to the large beam shift we have applied. Yeah, no problem, looks pretty good. Maybe we want to do a little bit of uh, filtering. What happens if I use a short exposure time? It's not gonna happen anything. The intensity will be the same. But what happens if I start increasing the duty cycle? Now it's 10%, this is still okay. You see now the base we're starting to saturate. This is an effect of uh, saturation. It's not saturated, you're not damaging the sensor whatsoever. It's just you're getting too many electrons. You see the shape of the zero loss peak is changing. I think that's pretty good. All right, so let's try to focus to make the zero loss peak very thin. You can also look at, um, uh, you can stop this one and you can look at the camera view here. And again, if you look at the camera view, you have linear counting and um, you could, you have the lifetime also encountered. So we reduce that. This is the, the lifetime correspond to the duty cycle here. So for the audience, we're in unfiltered mode right now. So we have an XPEG and the Titan, which means our inherent energy resolution is pretty close to one EV. So right now we have a one EV energy resolution in the beam and Palo is working with a 0 0.5 EV dispersion. So when you see him aligning the zero loss, the reason it fills mostly one channel is because um, it's almost perfectly aligned, which now we're imaging it so you can actually see the spectra on the on the camera. Okay, so we have uh, so we have our uh, our zero loss peak here, um, and you know you can align these two in a lot of different ways. I like a you know, you can put a box here. Because our collection angle is blocking at this, uh, this detector. So we're not actually taking advantage of, uh, you know, the all, uh, the all center. So if, for, for instance, if you wanna, if you're, uh, you're saturating and you wanna bump the intensity uh, more, I mean, you wanna bump the, uh, the, the dynamic range a little bit, you would probably use um, a little bit larger, um, um, Sorry, um, smaller, uh, sorry, uh, smaller collection angle. So you make uh, uh, the convergence angle inside the detector. The convergence angle stays the same, but you make the image of the probe bigger in the detector. So that would actually, so if I, for, for instance, if I, you don't really see much past this point. Okay. Uh, so if you wanna make, if you wanna spread them more, Obviously, you have to make the bright spot bigger. Okay. So you could do some alignments here as well if you want. Um, so right now we're using an exposure time. So the duty cycle is uh, uh, sorry the the, the electrostatic shutter is uh, partly uh, inserted. And this is uh, the exposure time that you're using. Okay, so the uh, the beam looks pretty good, um, but you know you can also look at you can also focus on uh, on the zero loss peak here and try to make it like as uh, as uh, try to make as thin as possible. So you go back to microscope, you click on uh, energy loss here. Actually, no, sorry, you click on focus. Unfortunately, we don't have automated. Uh, uh, capability for um, the the K2, but you know you could uh, do the same thing you do for uh, for the the other system. You try to make as thin as possible. So this is uh, an XFEG, so I'm not expecting great energy resolution, but no. try to make as thin as possible. Paolo, give me one second. The laptop is is running out of. Hold on, yeah. just wait one second. Um... All right, go ahead, back to what you're doing. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, and you can, um, you can uh, focus this one, try to make it, see it's getting worse now and try to make it as thin as possible.
Yeah, that's probably the best I could do. So you have you have about one EV energy resolution. Uh, you're not gonna get better than than the microscope. So that's already pretty good. Okay, so let's uh, actually put the beam here on the sample. This is a strontium titanate here. So what you do, you just change the energy to the titanium. I mean, I know that is uh, 456. And uh, now you see that you don't have enough intensity because now we're looking at the core loss. So you need to open the shutter completely, say 100%. And let's look at our core loss. So I'm going to bump this pusher time to 0.2. Yeah, you already have a pretty good energy resolution already. You can see that four peaks, not too bad for an uncorrected microscope, uh, for an X fag and the monochromatic is off. And you know, sometimes you can actually uh, improve uh, the energy resolution a little bit. So, you know, you could now, uh, this is because. Uh, there is uh, some, um, so I can focus on uh, on the titanium. So you can even uh, try to make a little bit better. Usually it's a little bit uh, of, uh, of uh, focus six and focus Y. You already start to see the other peak. Paolo, I think we have a question. Yeah. So that looks already pretty good in terms of energy resolution. So no need the monochromator for this type of work. I also like uh, save this alignment. So let me see if I can uh, um, I can uh, uh, load the disalignment again. I mean, I said specifically for uh, for the titanium. Um, let me see if I could get again. Oh. Super control. I think I I just saved it today. Um, yeah, today one fourteen. So let's see if it gets better now. But oh, it went down to zero again. See, unfortunately. So I. Greatly separated the zero speak. So let's see how it looks now. So you're not going to see any zero, any, any ghost peak at all. But just to tell it, that was the demonstration that you don't actually damage uh, the, the detector at all. I mean, I acquired the zero loss peak with the, uh, you know, the duty cycle completely open. There's no sign of damage at all. Because the technology implemented is a thin sensor. Let's we'll see if it looks better now. Maybe because I moved it uh, a little bit too much, but it looks worse than before. So let me. Um, let me play a little bit more with this. Getting worse. It's actually very easy with the titanium to do this work or with white lines in general. Oh, we had a good energy resolution before I, I ruined it completely by loading the alignment. <laughs> yeah, I guess let me go back to, to, go back to the zero loss at this point, no? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. And then let's remember it's here. Yeah, I should have left as it was. It was pretty good. Because usually it's like uh, you do like the zero loss peak, and then maybe you do like a, a small touch on um, on the core loss.
Let's see what happens if I run the bike. Yeah, the, the fact that it's saturating is nearly one pixel. It's actually a good sign. Let's look again at our um, uh, view here. Yeah, it looks, it looks pretty good, I think. Maybe there's a little bit of uh, S6. Yeah, actually not so much. I mean, it looks pretty decent now. Okay. All right, Robert. So now let's go up in uh, in uh, man in um, magnification. Let's look a little bit. Uh, let's do some task mapping. Robert. Yes. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Let's go up in magnification. Now let's let's look also there. Oh, you want to do atomic key of star directly? Did you change? Oh, we changed the camera light. The alignment looks like it's off a little bit. Um, no, I'm not trying to do atomic keyos. No, you you want to go to the inner? Right? Yeah, let's do some fast mapping. We'll do atomic keyos as well. You can also use this uh, feature here. Um, so you go on focus, and then uh, you have a focus loop, and uh, you could change. Uh, so you could change with the arrow key. I can change uh, the number of pixels inside and also the dual time. Very good. Yeah, looks pretty good. So once you're done, you just go and delete. Yeah, let's step down in magnification. So we'll take another area. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we did the drill speed. So let's look at uh, the, the car loss here. Hundred year. Yeah, it looks already pretty good. Look at this. And you know, you can also say, okay, let's do focus loop. I want to do a little bit here because I want to align my. I want to align my. Um, you know, my, um, maybe I want to improve slightly the energy resolution if possible. So, you know, you're still scanning there. It's getting worse. It's like very small uh, changes. That's probably the best that we have fixed. Usually it's just a little touch of a fix in FY. All right, that's pretty good now. And you know, like you can also, you can also refocus here to begin with. Didn't like that. Okay, so let's try to focus a little bit uh, here again. Yeah, it looks nicely in focus, the image. 
But you know what? Let me try some real fast some atomic kills. No, I like uh, I want to try some atomic kills real fast. Okay, so the software is telling you to use uh, a longer dual time. So you go to you go to preview here. We didn't like when I was in the focusing area. Okay, let's take uh, let's take an area here. I think we lost a little bit of focus, as well, uh, I would say. But doesn't matter. So you go to preview. And then uh, just go on the 2D array here. So let's take this area like this. Now, you define the exposure time here. So you say, okay, I want to um, say so right now I draw this box. The software is telling you that it's uh, divided this by 70 by 70 is a rectangular box, but you know, like you can change the sides. Let's do that. We want to do it like this. And you could play with, um, you know, with the step sides. So let's use a uh, step size. It's going to be one angstrom. The software automatically will play that it will take 22 minutes to cover the whole area. Oh. No, I so the software will take that will take uh, uh, 22 minutes to cover the whole area, but you know you can shorten the exposure time. So now 11 minutes, but maybe you can make it a little bit smaller. Something like this, maybe. And then maybe you choose one angstrom resolution. Then uh, perhaps uh, let's use five millisecond exposure time. So it will take two minutes and 33 seconds to cover the whole thing. I'm gonna make it smaller. I don't wanna wait that long. You want me to increase the magnification? I know it's fine. It's just a quick, uh, just a quick run. Um, let's check uh, here. I'm not gonna do the correction, but let's check. Um, I mean, potentially you can tell the software to close the valves after the acquisition. Um, you can do subtext or scanning, but that's not the case because you know this is a small, uh, a small. Uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the the step size is pretty small, and you can go and capture here. Actually, it's using even a shorter exposure time, two point five milliseconds. So we'll cover the all that in one minute. So you click capture, and the software now is going to collect uh, uh, the data. See, like beautiful spectra already. So, you know, nearly atomic level. So we're actually running at the camera at the top speed right now, 2.5 milliseconds exposure time. There's actually some interesting thing to say that it doesn't mark the exposure time that you put in there. You, because the camera always run at 400 frames per second. So if you wanna get to, you could play in different way. You can use a short exposure time, but increase the number of pixel and then some pixel together. Or you could go for a multi-pass uh, uh, acquisition that I'm going to show you like in a second. And actually, if we go up in my, uh, my resolution, uh, we can definitely do that. So you see the quality is actually pretty good. We got titanium here, oxygen. We see this, this guy here is uh, neodymium. If we can blunt the beam, Robert. Okay, so the way we process uh, this data here. So right click, you see there was a little bit of drift. This is the spectrum image, okay. So let, this is the STO. You see that uh, at least down to the background level, it's uh, atomic. So, so we have already pretty good energy resolution. Things are changing a little bit there. Uh, on the titanium, perhaps, you know, the crystal is changing. 
that you see pretty much everything. What about the oxygen there? This was done with 2.5 milliseconds exposure time. So the quality is actually pretty good. What about the neodymium? And so also the neodymium looks really good. And you know, you could go around and see if there is changing in, uh, in the neodymium. Maybe there are some uh, small changes, but you know, you can move around and see if there are changes. Now, the other thing that you want to uh, look at is just to show you the quality of the data. We, this is, uh, I believe, is the titanium, uh, sorry, the, this is the neodymium uh, M23 edge. This is a minor edge, but the fact that it's visible, uh, you could get chemical information looking at this edge as well. But the fact uh, that you can see that this edge show you the quality of, uh, of, uh, these, uh, of the detector. Another, uh, another thing you can see is, uh, because I know we have uh, strontium in there, so um, can we actually see the strontium? Yeah, you see the strontium very nicely there. So it looks pretty good. Something that uh, is typical of uh, direct detection is, um, you know, you can start from one single pixel. It just because as I was telling you before, you're only limited by short noise. This is only one single spectrum, but as soon as you start summing a bunch of spectra, look how the quality increase. So this is because we have uh, we are only limited by um, we are only limited by a short noise for the most part by short noise. Processing the data is very easy. Uh, you can go on the periodic table here, type oxygen, titanium, uh, neodymium and uh, strontium there. And you can say mop and then the display, let's display on the same workspace. So you see that titanium is already atomic, not too bad. The neodymium as well, strontium the same. There's one more thing, I mean, um, this is, let's take the, the neodymium map, which already looks pretty good. But you know, we would need the more pixel. I'm trying to make this larger, but it's very. You want me to add, I'll do it. I'll do it, Alan. Oh, okay, I did it. Okay, you see that this is it. We basically we use one angstrom step sites and you really see some uh, variation in uh, in the structure. Let's say that we want to put together uh, um, we want to, you see also maybe some dark spots in the oxygen map, maybe there are some oxygen vacancies. Uh, Robert was telling me that like, you expect oxygen vacancies there. So if you put uh, neodymium and titanium together, uh, the color is not very good, but uh, I'm going to convert neodymium to red. Okay, now you're getting a very nice uh, nearly atomic, uh, atomic map, but we could do this better for sure. Uh, but you see the structure uh, nicely defined uh, with all the elements. I mean, not too bad for a short exposure time. Okay, I want to show you one thing. So let's focus on... Um, so if you look at the, uh, the strontium here, the strontium looks good, but you see some noise because obviously this is a sharp noise. Um, how do we do? How do we make this better? The energy resolution is not an issue here, so there's one trick that you could play. You can bin this data. Actually, the advantage is leading to one of the questions that I was asked. Um, you know, like how to improve the, how to improve, how to reduce the data set size. You can play this trick. So you go on volume and you rebin this data set. So now you have three dimension, x and y. You want to change that. So you want to keep the same resolution, but you can be on the energy axis. So we go from like 4,000 pixels down to 2,000 pixels. So now let's try to compare these two. So I'm going to take this up here. So obviously I'm losing energy resolution, but all of a sudden now look at this, it looks much better than before. 
because uh, only combined pixel together. And this actually makes sense in the case of uh, the K2 because you're only limited by, for the most part, you're only limited by short noise. So you went from here to here really easy. And you know, like you can still uh, create the same maps. So the periodic table works at the elemental point. You just uh, click on, uh, uh, on this spectrum image, you can say map, and you can even tell the display on a new workspace. Show them where to click again to bend mode, uh, fellow. Okay. So now we're getting uh, new maps, and these are uh, from the data set that I was being. I mean, the Titania looks really nice. And, you know, we could go up in magnification, or we can look in a small area and, um, you know, like see these uh, where these areas are located. The interesting thing, I believe, I put the titanium and the oxygen together. Titanium oxygen and neodymium together. Okay, let me convert, uh, uh, let me convert the oxygen to blue and then you need them to right click and you convert it to red. Okay, so what can we do now? We wanna understand a little bit uh, the, the oxygen with respect to, uh, this is a trick that I was play with, um, uh, with Robert, but it helps you to understand how these elements are distributed. It works unfortunately free the, you know, with free maps because we only, we only have three cores available um, you know, to play with. Okay, we want to understand where uh, the oxygen is located. So with respect to the other, so we kill uh, all the other elements. So we're starting with the oxygen, which is uh, blue here. So you have some uh, area which, uh, and then we can boost a little bit the, uh, the oxygen here. So we have some area that uh, seem to be darker than other ones there. So let's try to get the neodymium in there and see where the neodymium is going. So you see now that neodymium is going right uh, at the edge. As soon as the neodymium appears, it's going right at the edge of where uh, these uh, bright uh, um, oxygen uh, regions are. And let's, what about the, uh, the titanium in there? And the titanium is going right inside the, where uh, these, uh, uh, actually the titanium is going where the bright, where bright uh, oxygens are. Does it make any sense, Robert? It could. Um, I mean, it. Right, we're expecting this to be an ionic conductor, so you're not the, the area that this scan is collected isn't. Remember, the other one had much larger black regions. Yeah, but you know, this, this one we're not sure. You can see in the HA in the neodymium how the contrast varies, right? So. But you you could play with this uh, with the color mix uh, in this way if you want to see where uh, the atoms are actually located and understand uh, how certain regions here. I mean, this is our neodymium map, neodymium map. So you see certain dark regions here. Um, for example, let's kill completely the the oxygen. Now you have this region here. So the neodymium is uh, is red. So. So you have this region here, you say, okay, what's happening uh, in between? So you start getting uh, the titanium in there, and then you start to see now the titanium is uh, appearing. And now you see the titanium is actually sitting, the titanium is the green one, is sitting right there, right in between. So you could see all of that easily. And, you know, this was done uh, real fast, I mean, with, uh, a resolution of one angstrom. I mean, we would need the more pixel uh, to get a better maps, but that's what's done like real fast. What about uh, uh, what about we do this in a little bit better way? Paolo, you did it very quickly. I just wanted you to show them where the uh, option was to bend the data uh, in the Z direction. Okay, so if oh yeah, I'll do I'll do it again and I'll uh, I'll show them. So if you if you unblank the B. Okay, so we want to move a little bit. I mean, this is, uh, I think we had the beam sitting there for a little bit too long. Uh, so we want to move a little bit to the left, the sample. You, the K2 came out. Oh, it's okay. It's normal. If you don't use it for some time, it will retract. Sorry, I have to think because you rotated the sample. Oh, 
for you. Oh, I like, for example, I like uh, this, uh, this region here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to be focusing in this region here. Oh, here, I'll move it. I can... Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. I want to focus on this read. I like uh, this structure here. So we're going to be doing this in a little bit more detail now. So I'm going to insert the K2 again. Just make sure we're in focus. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's good. It's good enough. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this region here now. So go to preview now. So the part of beam was parked there. So let's leave it that is already damaged. So preview. Good thing of the software is that like, you can actually use the same image. Now we are in, uh, I wanna capture this region here like that, like here. And you could say different approach. I can even uh, say, okay, I'm gonna drop, uh, I'm gonna use the same exposure time and I'm gonna drop this to maybe 0. 0.6. I don't have to go this far. So 0.6 tungsten, so I'm over sampling, which is unfortunately the conditions for atomic field, but I'm using still a short exposure time. Okay, let's say capture now. So we're gonna be switching to the other detector soon. For those of you that might be saying, why is the sample drifting or moving at this point? In this microscope, we have a mechanical stage. And so we just move the stage around. And if you really want to do the best atomic resolution yields, you would wait probably five to 10 minutes after moving the stage. And this drift would subside and your columns will look much more uniform and I guess sort of orthogonal the way they should for um, a cubic lattice. Even that being said, this still looks pretty good considering we just moved the stage. Okay, did you unblind the beam? Okay, so we use the same the same approach again. Um, I mean, you could go on here and say oxygen, titanium, strontium. I mean, there's not going to be strontium there, so uh, and then we use uh, titanium. Neodymium. Uh, neodymium is down here. Okay. Now, if you wonder, so. You open a spectrum if you wonder what we have. For example, uh, you look at the neodymium. And then uh, you can check, you can play, you can click this button and uh, you can even change the condition if you think, oh, you know, like I want to increase a little bit uh, my energy range. You can do that. See, beautifully, you see all the edges there. You can increase it there. Um, look at the quality now; it's really good. Um, you could see that you could see the same thing also for uh, for the other elements as well. Um, you can even change. You could say, okay, I don't want to include right now. You're essentially you're doing some fitting. Are you using uh, this uh, this portion as a sort of uh, uh, reference? Uh, for uh, the titanium, and it's the software is using an Afrislater uh, cross section. 
but you can tell the software to, I want to exclude the illness. So meaning there is no use in this structure here, which might give you some benefits for uh, quantification, but not so much for mapping. Actually for mapping, I want to take advantage of the region where you have the most uh, intensity, which is uh, the near edge fine structure. So I think it's better if you do it this way. Uh, and you know, you can also change the cross-section model. For example, if you look at the neodymium here, if it's a little bit off, you can uh, tell the software to basically apply some chemical shift. Sometimes it's just to correct uh, um, maybe some energy drift or uh, some uh, misalignment in, uh, in the spectrometer. So you just click on uh, here if you want to change, if you want to make some changes in the feed. So, okay. You say map, and then you could tell the software to display in the same workspace uh, or in the new workspace. Let's do it in the same workspace. Again, we're getting very nice maps. You see all the structure here, look at this. Um, all this diagonal structure is actually there's a, there, you don't see much uh, titanium. Let's put them together. This is very interesting. Uh, let's put the titanium, actually all of them together, titanium, magnesium, and oxygen. Yeah, look at this, beautiful. So you go here on display. Uh, the oxygen is red, which usually I don't like it very much. I want to have uh, the uh, neodymium red. And I want to have the oxygen blue. Something like that. So let's kill the oxygen completely. And now the, my neodymium is red. So let's do, oh, look at this. Now you see all this region here. Uh, it's a diagonal region here. It's actually made of neodymium. And then you start to get the, the oxygen in there. Look over, sorry, the titanium. Look where the titanium is sitting. So you see how many this sample, this area is a little bit off axis. That's why the, the atomic doesn't look very nice. But you can clearly see the region here. The, you know, the, the, the neodymium. So the neodymium is gone. You can see where the neodymium is sitting there very nicely. And this is a, it's not a pro-corrected instrument, but you're able to do the same thing you do with the pro-corrected instruments. Um, you have some regions here where uh, there might be different, uh, different neodymium. So we can just leave it like this and uh, let's go analyze our spectrum. So a good thing you could do with, uh, with digital micrograph is you could uh, mirror. So just drag um, the bigger tool on the other area. And let's look at the neodymium. So I'm going to do, I'm going to right click on, uh, on the spectrum and uh, say clean spectrum, because I don't want to see all the, all the stuff that I use for, uh, you know, to do the, uh, to do the quantification. Now I want to be focused essentially on uh, um, on my neodymium edge. I don't know if there are any changes going to maybe this specific region here compared to this region there. Um, Unfortunately, there's a little bit of drift. There wasn't drift, but we couldn't uh, sum a few spectra together. But the quality is still pretty good, even if I, and you know, the neodymium is also like a very nice edge. To go from here to here, is there any changes? I don't know. But you know, you have enough quality to tell if there's something uh, happening in your uh, uh, in your sample. Same thing with titanium. I mean, you can even focus on the titanium. We could do one across the interface and show the oxidation change. Oh yeah, uh, that could be the next experiment. So you see, actually, surprisingly, there. Yeah, I mean, you you can just go around and uh, and see, but obviously, going from the STO to this region, you see like a big change. So I want to do now. I want to put the ultra scan now. So I'm going to retract uh, my K2.
and insert my um, and insert the, my other camera. Okay, um, load here. Oh, it's loading, so. I'm blank to beam. Okay, so we wanna compare Apple with Apple. So we use a dispersion one. So which gives you 2000 EV energy range. And then let's look at the spectrum now. So we have to deal with the bin there, which we don't have but with the cage. That's why I'm saying that the cage is actually easier than, uh, than a CCD because you have to deal with binning. Now we have to deal with binning. We're binning one to 130, one to five. So I recommend to use a one to 130. So let's look at the zero speed first. And I can focus this just like I did uh, with uh, with the key two. Um, actually, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do manual. Stuff. So it's getting worse. You can see. But yeah, that's probably the best they could do. It looks pretty nice and thin. Mm -hmm. This is all point spread function of the of the detector. That's that's pretty bad. It gets better at low energy again because you have less elastic scattering. Um yeah, let's do the same thing. So let's switch to 456, like we did before. And now we use uh, an exposure time of 0 0.002.5. 0 0 0 0 0 Let's try to go to the same area. I think we use this area here, if I remember correctly. And we're using the same conditions, same as before. It's going to capture. Didn't change the squash of time, didn't change the air. Yeah, you see, one thing that you notice that is significantly slower than before, and I can, even though the exposure time is the same, now this is slower, but why is it slower? You're going at 311 spectra per second as opposed to 400 spectra per second we were collecting before, because the, the, the CCD doesn't have 100% uh, duty cycle, because you have to move uh, charge uh, pixel by pixel. So while it's a slower scan, we didn't move the sample. So note that the drift is improved. The sample as it should. So 
That's very good. So let's check out our data, our quality, first of all. So right click here. Yeah. Again, look at the 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 energy resolution of uh, um, titanium is not very good. It looks decent, but what happens when we get down in pixel? So we are significantly losing a good amount of energy resolution which might be important for uh, your uh, experiment. Let's do the same thing we did before. So let's type of uh, the elements here, titanium, neodymium, and oxygen. I will look at these maps here. And we want to do in the same display, in the same map. Um, Okay, so maps still look pretty good. We probably have a good amount of beam current. Um, yeah, again, we've seen the same thing we saw before. These maps still look as nice as what we had before. Oh, this is the new demo. Oh, actually, let's put the let's put the elements uh, the elements together here. And. So you have a pretty good. Uh, I mean, you. I mean, you're getting similar to what we did before. It's it's actually pretty bright. The samples seem to be more stable, so that helps on uh, on uh, on the map. But what we were interested in before is to look at the actual quality here on this region here. Yeah, so you probably need a little bit better energy resolution, but what we could see before is uh, it's actually the uh, looking at the oxygen here, and all all this structure is actually uh, this is not very real. This is all uh, uh, noise. Yeah, you don't have enough energy resolution to tell differences there. Uh, just to give a little bit of difference uh, here. So let's, now that uh, we have the Microsoft table, let's put the K2 back. Oh. I might be the culprit here. I didn't blink the beam. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was part there, it's fine. Okay, so let's, uh, first of all, let's make sure that uh, things are still at zero and Yeah, so we have to focus. That's pretty, even if we're still scanning the beam, it's, uh, it's actually pretty good. We can focus easily. Usually it's only FX and FY. Yeah, something like that.
yeah, probably something like that may might be the best for what I can do. Um, let's go to four fifty six. Yeah, looks already pretty good in terms of energy resolutions. I'm not going to touch that. How long is it going to take? Um, maybe like a minute. Let's do one thing. If you uh, take a minute, let's make it a little bit smaller. We're just interested in this region. Yeah, there's some damage there because we forgot the beam. Yeah, so let's do two at zero point six. And uh, let me do um, multi pass. So you go here and say, okay, I want to do maybe a uh, feel for multi pass. And these are going to be like really fast acquisition. So you apply drift correction. So you want to do every frame. So it means every acquisition you do a drift correction. And I'm going to do like uh, here on this amorphous in this damage motif is a good reference. You don't want to go too far from uh, the region of interest, but you don't want to be too close to the region of interest. Um, we are slightly outside. You bump a little bit the exposure time here. Because you want to get a good reference image. So now we'll do some drift correction as well. But we're going to do multi pass, so that would increase the quality of our data. Actually, you know what? Let's go down here now. Okay, and then say capture. So it's going to do the drift correction now. And then it will uh, it will acquire like really fast. It will take probably um, less than a minute of a frame. Just give me one second. Yeah, unfortunately, we should have done uh, this acquisition a little bit faster than that, but that's basically the top speed of uh, of the K2. Um, you see there's still some uh, drift in there.
Okay, it's done. We, oh, actually, there's one more acquisition. But this is actually a way of increasing the quality. Unfortunately, this is uh, drifting a little bit too much. Did you, did you? I'm like, I'm surprised it's moving that much. I'm not really sure why. Uh, yeah, it's okay. So let's look at the quality now. So we sum uh, uh, frames together. So still pretty good energy resolution, very good quality. And, uh, you know, you can still um, do the, um, uh, your maps. Um, same as before. Um, same as before. Um, you do new. Actually, we also have uh, the la uh, the strong in there. You see, by the la uh, the reference image, there is still la uh, there is still decent at least there. Uh, you're still getting pretty good maps here. Yeah, you can see the area where there is more nadimium uh, is uh, more intense than the other one. Um, that's just to give you like a quick idea. Do you do you actually want to switch to um, TM imaging? Yeah, we do some load dose imaging. We should do an extended structure and then switch to TM, I think, no? Extended fine structure. Yeah, yeah, let's let's see this one for uh, the new demium here. Oh, and did you want to do a quick MLLS analysis of this to show the change in titanium oxidation state? Oh, yeah, we can do that. Okay, so let's focus on uh, yeah, you see pretty good quality there. So the extended fine structure, as you asked, you actually look at the, the feature right outside and um, it, you know you really need a good uh, you really need the good quality to see that um, but you want to see some MLS fitting okay all right so if you want to do MLS fitting the new software uh, we can do that uh, nearly automatically once you set up your uh, reference so this is uh, from um, um, actually I didn't have um, I don't know, I forgot to center the zero speed. But it doesn't matter. So let's, uh, uh, this is a little bit manual what I'm doing. So what we see as we go from the substrate into the layer is that the titanium oxidation state changes. And so you're gonna see a change in the shape of the peak. And yeah, how to map that and show that. So you extract a spectrum there after you fit the background. This is one spectrum from the STO. Then we go into the other one, just give you like a quick example. So we're doing here and then you extract the spectrum there. Okay. So we have these two spectra. Let's compare. The interesting thing is that uh, we actually see some uh, you see a little bit of neodymium even inside the STO. And again, this is because of data detection and you're like very sensitive to traces. It would be nice to test with the other detector as well. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't use uh, the mouse properly in this setup. Okay. Yeah. 
And we hope you can see there are some differences in, uh, in the fine structure oxygen and you see differences there as well. Okay. You see also changes in the oxygen in the oxygen as well. So we want to try to do that to map these uh, little these little changes. So what we do, uh, we have two reference spectra. Okay, so we take a reference spectra from the two phases. Then you need a reference spectra for the background. So the assumption of MLS fitting, which stands for uh, multiple linear least square fitting, is that each spectrum is the combination of uh, three. Uh, I mean, it's a combination of a certain number of uh, uh, standard. Okay, so a certain number of components. For example, uh, what I'm assuming now is that each spectrum is going to be the sum of uh, reference one, reference two, plus uh, a background contribution, okay? So you need to fit the three components and the software will give you like, uh, um, will basically uh, give you like uh, the, um, the distribution of uh, each component. So the software is gonna do pixel by pixel is going to, uh, find the scaling coefficient and then you multiply by the, uh, uh, you know, by the, the reference spectrum. I will tell you the amount of uh, that specific uh, component. The same thing with the other one. So that's basically what multiple linear least square fitting does. And it's very important if you wanna map uh, different chemical phases. I showed you some example in, uh, in the presentation. Now let's go to spectrum here. So you go to, you click on the spectrum image, go to, go to spectrum, at least in this uh, software. And what I'm showing you here is done automatically in the new software, but it's good to learn how to do it manually, I think. So say, okay. So now the software is gonna tell you which reference you want to use. So I want to use, um, say one signal, B signal there. And what else there should be? So B, C, B, A, and there should be a background. So I'm gonna use this background here, okay? You can even extract, okay? Now we want to go perhaps from uh, this point, or maybe you want to, you want to go from, uh, you want to fit uh, to the fit maybe from 440 to 480. I'm only doing the fitting in this region, but this is where actually the fine structure is changing. I'm doing 470 to this point here. I click OK. OK, so, um, and actually, let me let me do it again in a, a little bit better way. I think I should uh, give a little bit more uh, uh, more intensity there. So let's do a uh, spectrum here. Let me try again. Perhaps I should do parent spectrum image, and you want to go from uh, signal one to the background. Okay, and then you want to go from this point to perhaps four eighty. Now, this is uh, the component uh, one. So basically the titanium extracted from uh, the STO and this is the other one from uh, the nodidium area. So you see that one is uh, richer than the other one. So that's good. This is the background uh, component. We don't care about that. Um, this should be the residual. And this is the actual uh, MLS fit to the spectrum image. So we don't care about uh, this too much. Uh, we don't care about this one too. And we don't care about the background. We only care about this too. So to make uh, your uh, map a little bit better, you can remove the negative components, uh, the negative counts. Uh, I like to go on cross wire, but it, you know, literally boosts the contrast. Let's make sure that this is good. And we do the same thing there. Okay. 
So then you have the two contribution of uh, oxidation state and uh, you can actually put them together in, uh, in cover mix. So you have uh, BP, which is uh, just the neodymium one, and the other one is for uh, the thing. Uh, sorry, from the STO. So then, you know, you can see the different, uh, different components here. There's not really much of the other one in there. So that's to give an idea a little bit of how to do MLS fitting. I mean, if you're looking at carbon-based material and you want to look at different phases, you could do that. Now, the problem when you do MLS fitting is the more component you fit, the more noise you're going to get. Because the same, the, the number, the total number of, uh, I mean, the, the, the intensity is fixed. And now you're going to, um, to spread that uh, over, uh, you know, more components. The more components you have, the more, no the more noisy your, uh, your maps are going to be. That's something that you have to uh, remember. And it's very dependent on the quality of your, uh, on the quality of your reference spectrum, and the quality of your data. I think we should do the uh, the load those uh, the load those uh, TM imaging because it's getting late. Okay. <clears throat> um, I mean, all you're going to do for Excel is switch to four thousand EV, no? No, no. Uh, the the load those imaging. I know. I know. Yes, right. TM imaging. Yeah, I know. All right. Um... Any questions uh, while we switch to TM mode? Any questions so far before we switch to load those uh, TM? No questions. Oh, actually, if I look at the chat, there's a lot of questions. Oh, radial distribution. Okay, that's a different thing. Yeah. Well, what they mean by that is they want to do extended fine structure and then model the modulations off the backside of it, like you would do a radial distribution function in X ray. Okay. Or in synchrotron data, right? Okay, upcoming events. Okay, can you comment on performing yields experiment? Uh, can you question? Let's go K2. There's no, okay, okay. Let's, there's not the time in, uh, in the K2. Um, it's 100% duty cycle. Um, so there's not really any, in the, or at least there's not that time that you can really appreciate any, any, any effect. Um, so duty cycle, uh, someone asked uh, the meaning of duty cycle. So, so the way we define the, the duty cycle is uh, essentially it's like the efficiency of uh, your detector, how fast that you can read out, uh, you can read out data. Um, like for example, uh, if you're putting an exposure time of uh, one milliseconds, if your duty cycle is 100%, you would expect a thousand uh, spectra or a thousand images for that given amount of time. 
Okay, that would define duty cycle to be like 100%. If your duty cycle is 50%, then uh, you are getting uh, 500 images. So now with the with the K2, having the K2 like a duty cycle of 100% means that the top speed of the K2 is uh, a 400 frame per second. So if I put in a exposure of time of 2.5 milliseconds, I would get um, um, I would get 400 spectra per second. That doesn't apply to the CCD because in the case of a CCD, you move uh, charge pixel by pixel. So you bin because you want to combine pixel together. And when you combine pixel together, you actually reduce the number of pixels uh, that uh, you need to shift the charge. So that would uh, buy you a lot of time. At the same time, you're combining pixel together. And that actually leads again to like a previous question that I was asked. Um, if that would help in the case of a K2. But in the case of a K2, you read everything at the same time, you read out. But in the case of, uh, of a CCD, you actually read out uh, one pixel at a time. So that's why binning is very important for, uh, um, for a CCD. So now that the faster you go, I mean, the faster uh, you, you, you move a pixel at the same time. So the faster you go, that in the case of a CCD, we definitely uh, will definitely affect uh, uh, you know the duty cycle because you know you still have to move the charge of pixel by pixel. So this is why the duty cycle of uh, of a CCD um, it gets worse and worse as you go as you go faster and faster. The faster you go, the worse your duty cycle is. For example, uh, we found that uh, if you run uh, with, with the previous example, we were running. Uh, um, 2.5 millisecond exposure time, and with the uh, with the CCD we were getting 300 images, 300 spectra per second. So you can calculate you already lost about 25 percent of your duty, the duty cycle is only 75 percent. So whereas with the K2 we were getting 400 images per second, 400 spectra per second. So that's basically to give a little bit the idea. Zero loss peak was not aligned. Uh, yes. What are we looking here on the peaks? Uh, oh, in the case of a titanium, uh, you're basically looking at, uh, you can extract information about the oxidation state as well as, uh, um, you know, the crystal distortion, for example, um, like I showed you in one of the examples in the presentation. There is drift correction, uh, we did show that. Uh, I'm, to be honest, I, I don't think drift correction is needed very much, um, but, um, I showed you the example of uh, the multi-frame where, uh, you know, like drift, uh, uh, drift correction can be, can be used. I, okay, so uh, the duty cycle, I asked that. That's uh, uh, the EL sub view default to counting mode. Yes, EL sub, we run EL in counting mode. The reason we do that is because uh, we get the best quality. Um, so you can do EL, with the K2, you cannot do EOS in accumulation mode, only counting mode. So I missed the meaning of the cycle. So we already explained that. Uh, the other question, can you collect maps uh, in super resolution mode? Uh, no, we can't. But we can collect images in super resolution mode for whatever it's worth. Okay. Um, Let's some blank beam now. Oh, we are still in a spectroscopy. So now we're doing TM imaging. Okay, so I want to show you a little bit how you, we do low dose imaging. I know that some of you are actually interested in uh, in uh, doing uh, um, doing some uh, uh, looking at MOF and acquiring uh, high resolution images from uh, MOF material, which you know happen to be very uh, very beam sensitive. Sorry, you 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 go, Paolo. There should be a beam on the camera or the cam a beam on the camera now. Oh. There's yeah, the screen's up and the beam is on blank. Well, I don't see much here. I don't see. Um, oh, okay. It could be so again, uh sorry. The ADF is still in this way. Uh Let's take the ADF out. So that's a good thing of the software tells you. I think I can, uh, um, I think I'm not able to control that anymore. Control. Uh... Okay.
Okay, see the, the duty cycle is actually pretty low there. So let's bump that. So you start to see some counts there and now you see the image, okay. Um, so right now, okay. First of all, first of all, you start from TM imaging here. Uh, so from uh, the application uh, techniques manager, you just open TM images, that's all you need. And uh, now you have the K2 selected, you're in FTM mode here. And uh, now the lifetime, uh, this is basically the duty cycle. Essentially you're operating the electrostatic shutter. Right now we see that we're finding like uh, the counts there. And you know, you just operate this camera in the normal way. I mean, this is right now is not, is not low dose condition. So you can put an FFT there. I mean, it's not in focus. We need to, I was just trying to get a beam on the camera to start with. We were setting it up. So let's focus this one. So right now we are not in a low dose conditions. No. <clears throat> can we view the image though so I can get it at a reasonable mag to take a, a scan? Say it again. View the image. I need to see the sample so that we can get it in focus and view the image. I don't know what you what you're trying to do now. Just get an image. Oh. So what we're doing now, this is not something that you want to, you would destroy the uh, your moth right away by doing like that. I agree, but I, right now I, I haven't found the sample yet. So I would like this, I'm just trying to see where the sample is. How would you, how should we do this? So first of all, you try to get your image uh, aligned. And then uh, if you're doing like, a, if you're doing like a moth, uh, this is, I mean, I can help you out once you have a moth. So what you do, because Right now we have we're working in high dose conditions. I mean, I can show you how to operate that lab, the camera in low dose condition, but you still have to do some uh, something on the microscope in low dose conditions. Basically, what you do, you you just no problem. But what I'm, right now we're right now I was just going to look at the sample. I, we haven't set this up for low dose at all. That's what I thought we would do right now. Right now I have I don't know three or four nanograms of current on the screen. Yeah, I have five nanograms of current on the screen. So I thought we were going to define what we wanted on the screen for low dose conditions. No. Okay. All right, lift up the screen. Okay, so, all right. So now you are a linear mode, or not exactly what we are, but you see linear mode, the counts are pretty low. We see literally nothing. Let's see what happens uh, if you switch to counting mode. Okay. Now the software C is measuring, I mean, the count, I mean, the, the dose, this is too low. Yeah, I don't, it should be, it shouldn't have been, try it again. I'm not sure why I did that. It should have been high from the beginning because I have a large current. You should, you probably need to be in linear mode. No. No, okay. Oh, now it's. Okay, I'll uh, explain you that in a second what I'm doing. Okay. All right. So we were actually in high dose conditions earlier. So what you're looking at, first of all, is if you look down here, you see uh, the software because we are in counting mode. So you select counting mode. And uh, I had to reduce the dose on the camera by uh, activating the electrostatic shutter because we were not in low dose conditions. So okay. So if you look at this one here, the, uh, the image is dark. Um, I don't even know where we are in the sample. Are we in the sample, by the way? We should be. We should. Yeah, we should be. 
We should, I, I would think we should be able to see the sample with the interface and the platinum cap. That's what I was trying to find. That's why I was confused. I, I had it on, I guess I had it before you saw the lattice. So I'm just not sure what happened to the image. Okay, so you look at down here. So the camera is telling you that you have 14 electrons per pixel uh, per second. So let's see what happens uh, if I go capture here. Uh, I don't even know where we are now. Oh, why can't? Uh, yeah, so there's, 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 the, we're not, there's a, there's a beam there. Is, we're, we're completely off. I guess this is what I was trying to say, Paolo. We need to, I need to see something to be able to set it up. So I was trying to view the, the image. I'm sorry, I wasn't explaining myself very well. So wait, I'm gonna say, so let me do the ultra scan now. Um, so you have to make sure that uh, first of all, we have the beam on uh, on the detector. I don't know why it looks like that because it doesn't look like that on the beam. Okay, so load those conditions. So if you do load those conditions, um, essentially you have to start with your microscope in, uh, essentially you are in a sort of low magnification mode. You go in diffraction and then uh, you navigate um, your sum. If you're looking at MOF in diffraction mode, uh, you're looking at the screen of your microscope you set up for load dose condition where you have extremely low dose condition. Right now, we don't have low dose conditions. Um, but anyway, so it, if you are, uh, you go in diffraction, you move around and uh, you actually find uh, a diffraction pattern that looks like, uh, it looks like, you know, your sample is tilted in, uh, your particle is tilted in, uh, in the direction that, uh, you know, that, that you want and the orientation that you need. And at that point, you switch uh, from diffraction to imaging mode and you start acquiring images. So that's basically a little bit like uh, what you would do in low dose condition, especially when you work in sample like the MOF, because you need to find uh, the area of the sample that is uh, kind of like in zone. So now if you can move the sample a little bit on the left. Okay. All right, that's fine. Okay, so this is, what happened? Oh, yeah. I, I didn't mind. Thank you. There we go, Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. So what you want to do now is um, um, we could grab an image, say like, you want to grab an image of it, like, second. Actually, no, let's not do that. Let's switch to the K2 at this point. Let's reduce, let's reduce uh, the intensity. Spread the beam. I mean, right now we are pretty high dose conditional. Let's spread the beam to the point that... Uh, well, there we have no image on the K2, on the US-1000. We still see something. Okay, good. Let's save it like this. So let's put the K2 now. Oh, let's uh, low, uh, insert. So now we are in counting mode. 
The interesting thing you start to see some reflection there, but you know the the duty cycle is activated, so you wanna you wanna open computer. You read here that we're working on um, 0 0.05 electrons per pixel per second, so the dose is extremely low now. Let me bump the dose, uh, Robert. You don't have to do anything now. So I I actually open up the shutter completely. Look at this. So now we actually start to see something there. So you see some electron sparse, but on, uh, and you're working at about one electrons per pixel per second. This is the 0 0.1 electrons. Uh, but you already have uh, some uh, atomic information. Then you just have to do a little bit of, uh, you can do some dose fractionation. And uh, if you do dose fractionation, essentially you're taking uh, multiple images. And I can take images up to uh, perhaps, uh, um, yeah, we can use a free, well, actually let's use four seconds. The software is telling you that it's gonna acquire a, a stack of images at 0 0.2 seconds each, and then you can align them and correct them for the drift. Let's try to do that. So you click on dot fractionation and you could play with the total exposure time. You can play also with the number of, uh, with the exposure time per frame. So the software now is gonna collect a stack of images. Uh, Robert, something uh, happened again here with the beam. Did you move the beam? No. Um, I don't know why that happened. It doesn't look like that at all. Well, oh, actually, no. Sorry, I take it back. Um, yeah, no, it should have been. That should have. That's all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let, let me see. This should be. Okay. Oh, here. Okay, so this is the stack of images. So you go to display that we acquired and you start summing frames. And now you see a little bit of contribution there. I think we still need a little bit of better dose, but a little bit higher dose. But you already see a little bit of lattice there. Now, what you can do, you can tell the software to correct for the drift. Okay, so you go here, TM images, you go to process image, and then you tell the software to measure the drift. So the software is gonna go through each uh, image in the stack and it's gonna measure the drift. That's how they do in uh, Cryo EM, by the way. And then uh, you remove that. Do you think 21 images is enough or would you need more? No, for the dose, it's probably need a little bit more, but but it doesn't matter here because um, what you look at is um, uh, also the magnification is not very high, but if you go, if you take an ad like this, for example. Well, we can go up a little bit and- Yeah, no, let me, let me say this one first and you go on live FFG. So you already see the, the um, you know, the, um, I mean, you still have some resolution in there and, you know, things changing as you go there. So you have the information there in the image. So if you look at uh, what is the resolution here that we're having per pixel, the resolution per pixel, let me measure that. So each pixel is only one angstrom. So, you know, 1.1 angstrom each pixel. So you might want to go a little bit up in uh, in uh, in magnification. So if we could go like uh, one, so it's go back to TM imaging again. So right now we're really working in low dose conditions. So you measure here. So you can even bump the dose a little bit because I mean, the dose is extremely low right now. It's only 0 0.3 electrons per pixel. So maybe bring it to uh, four electrons per pixel. No, it's too much. 
Okay, that's fine. So you want to go maybe one uh, one step up in magnification. Okay, we have something back I can see in the image. Um, okay, we're seven two. So in case everyone hasn't noticed this, on the very bottom of the screen, there's a uh, electron count where it says 10.73 at this point. All right, so the image, uh, the image looks pretty good. So, but you can even, uh, so this is a low dose image, right? Um, so you click on the image automatically. Okay, uh, so the software now is telling the uh, photo electron, let's leave it like this, let's not touch it. So let's take, uh, let's do the same thing, dose fraction action, and uh, let's repeat that perhaps, let's take uh, more images. So we are taking pretty much 40 images and we're gonna line them together. So the software now is gonna collect all these images together. And then you could do drift correction like we did before. Okay, it's done. So let's look at our uh, stack now. That that it is. No, that it is. I think that's the last one that we collect. Okay, so you go back to display. Now this is only one image. You see, like forty-two images here. And then you start to if you start to some. Sorry, we start to sum frames. You see that it's getting better and better and better. And then you have the resolution there. But let's see what happens if we do some drift correction. So you have the stack here, you go back to TM imaging gear, process image, and you measure the drift. Let's see if we can improve uh, uh, the quality a little bit. Okay, then you say remove. Let's see if uh, we gain something in resolution. Okay. So that's the align one. It's difficult to say if we gain something in, uh, in resolution. We can look at, uh, we have to look at certain areas that we believe. So this one that was perfectly on zone and um, you can compare that with what you have before. Or even better, you can look at the FFT. So this is a line. And this is, uh, not uh, online before. Uh, 
um, you know, you can see if, uh, you know, there was enough uh, drift uh, that, you know, was affecting uh, the resolution. Let's look at this region here of the FFT. Yeah, I mean, I don't see big, uh, big changes after uh, correction, but you know, you could do drift correction uh, as well. Um, let's see how this, uh, this is the image right now. So let's go back to the imaging. Okay, this is our image. Uh, we have uh, five electrons per pixel per second. So let's stop this one. And now let's try to see the same thing with the other detector. Let's look at the difference now. Let's make sure that we have binning one, so it's apples with apples at least. Okay, this is the image uh, with the CCD. You can see much. So let's use, uh, we don't have those fractionations here, but you know, we can accumulate the charge in the four seconds. This is my image with uh, with the CCD. I'm gonna find it now. Over here. See, let me, the quality is not quite the same from what we had before. So we can zoom in here and we can say this is, uh, so actually we can even compare before alignment and after. Uh, so this is the K2 and this is uh, the regular detector. Yeah, so you see like a pretty big, uh, pretty big difference in uh, in quality. But that's normal. I mean, that's also why we we're selling a lot of this detector for uh, for cryo EM. But anyway, some of the things that I showed you is not something. This is not the way you set up an experiment for uh, low dose imaging. Um, just make sure. So if you're gonna do low dose imaging. First of all, you need to know you need to know how your microscope. Uh, the conditions of your microscope for low dose imaging first. So you need to know what dose that you want to shoot for. And then uh, you need to know how you get to that dose. So first of all, you need to know, first of all, you need to know the conditions of your microscope first. You need to decide the conditions uh, that you want to use uh, to acquire uh, an image. And then after that, you want to, uh, you need to know how you get to those conditions. Then, you know, if you're working on MOF, uh, put the sample in, um, go to this low dose condition, switch to diffraction, and uh, navigate until you find uh, an area of the sample uh, that looks like uh, on uh, where the particle is on zone or close to zone. 
because you're not going to be able to tilt. And you can tilt because you're going to be destroying the sample if your sample has been sensitive. So the best chance is go to diffraction, move your sample around. And until you see a sample, until you see an area that looks like it's on zone, then you switch to imaging and you talk all like an image right away. So first of all, you need to know how uh, you need to you need to have your you need to know how to get to certain conditions and uh, how to get the microscope set up for that. So essentially, you can use the K2 to monitor the dose, and uh, you know you look right at the bottom. You can see you can see the dose. There's a last experiment that uh, we could do. I mean, we could go back to the K2. I can insert the K2 now. Okay, can you, Robert, can you go one step down in magnification? Or oh, actually one step up. So let's look at this interface in more detail. We need a little bit more pixel. You can also use a super resolution, which to be honest with you, I never tried. So, Looks like uh, the beam um, changed the position or... Uh, yeah, I think I'm, oh, no, every time I change mag, it blinks the beam. Oh, okay. That's an interesting issue. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to do this, this job, you have to make sure that uh, the microscope is uh, perfectly set up. You know, you change the magnification and the, the, the beam doesn't change uh, the illumination. The illumination stays constant. Okay, that's good. Looks pretty good now. Uh, I mean, you increase the dose too much, you can see here. Yeah, that's fine. Let's leave it, uh, put it to five. Five electrons per pixel per sec. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, this looks already pretty good. And you know, you can also say, okay, let's do the same thing. Let's do like a one uh, dose uh, fractionation. And uh, you have some. Sorry, I didn't mean that. I'm gonna to try to do some um, um, super resolution after this, see if we, if we gain something there. Obviously, super resolution will make uh, your data even bigger, your data set even bigger because you're increasing uh, um, the pixel. I think that's the one. So display again, and then let's start summing frames. So the quality looks already pretty good. Let's see what happens if I go on super resolution. Okay, obviously the dose is decreasing per pixel because we're increasing the number of pixels. Okay, so let's actually, I'm gonna do like a capture and yeah, five seconds should work fine. Okay, that's my, yeah, that's my dose fractionation. So now you see this image is nearly 8K by 8K. Um, I don't know if it looks much better than the one we did before, but definitely this takes uh, 
uh, a little bit more data to because you're in, again you're increasing the number of pixels. That's probably it. Um, the load those uh, that are uh, you have to look at certain aspect, but when you do load those again, you have to make sure that you know the conditions that you want to use for your experiment before. The camera, as you can see, is very sensitive. Is able uh, to find uh, is able to work uh, with uh, essentially not intensity. So, actually, Robert, can you do? Um, I just want to as a proof of concept. Can you reduce uh, the intensity, reduce down to even below one electron per second per pixel? That's to show the extremely low dose condition, the camera will work by you going the other way. Uh, what, a little bit more? No, le less intensity. Less. less intensity? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So right now the dose is extremely low. Okay, it's only one electron per angstrom square, 1.3. So let's do one capture. Let's see what happens if we some frame. Okay. Oh, here, that's the one. Yeah, I still have my information. And uh, I, if, I, if I go for like a 10 second exposure time, it's gonna be the same as the other image before. Because again, the camera is not affected by other type of noise. But imagine that like, we just keep the same dose and I'm gonna be switching, I'm gonna stop this and uh, switch to um, the other detector real fast. That's the last uh, example that I showed you, that I show you here. And we just go straight for uh, five seconds exposure time like we did before. Let's see what we get with the ultra scan. Okay, so oh. okay, so this is the ultra scan. You see something, but it's far from um, you know you don't have any information there. Uh, I mean, you don't see anything in the image. Did you actually have uh, the, the information in the FFT? We can check. A little bit. What happens if we compare with the other one? So that's basically the difference in information that uh, you're comparing. So that's a huge difference. We go a lot farther there. I don't know if you have any questions on this. Basically, we see a little bit of the low frequency, but you know, we there's a lot of stuff that we don't see. So do we, there's three questions located here. Oh, let me let me switch to the questions. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if there are any new. I think you answered these already. Oh yeah, I think I did. I did answer all the questions. I don't think there are any questions uh, related to the the imaging part.
any other questions, audience, participants? I mean, you have a pretty good system. I mean, if when uh, I know that some of you are working on uh, MOS, uh, MOF and uh, or are planning to work on MOF, uh, be uh, be happy to um, to help you. Um, it it would be a lot easier, you know, like to be there in person because there's uh, there's there are certain things that you have to do on the microscope. But I'll be happy. I'll be happy to help. I think we would take you up on that, Paolo. Uh, you know. Uh, so I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's so once you, yeah, I mean, once you see how you do it, and this is unfortunately that's not something that uh, we can do like remotely. But once you see what to do on the microscope, it becomes uh, it's it's pretty straightforward. But first of all, you need to know the conditions. You need to know how right. to do certain conditions. It's the uh, serendipitous aspect of. Um you know, wandering around in diffraction mode until you find a particle on zone that might be time consuming. Um, but I think, um, I think you can help. Well, I don't know that you can help with that aspect, but I think you can help very much with the aspect of getting, making sure that the microscope's in the right condition and that we're collecting with the minimum dose. That it really depends on uh, how big your uh, MOF uh, structure is. Right, and how many particles you have and how many are on the right. So also how flat the particles are. There's a lot of there's a lot of condition. I mean, I was. It's um, there are uh, there are cases. I mean, we've done uh, MOF uh, a lot of time, but some cases uh, were actually it was pretty tough. Other cases, uh, and uh, you have to be really on on the edge of the particles. Other cases, you know, the particle. I don't know if there's something related to the way you know the sample is prepared, but. In other th in other cases, uh, you you could find the particle like right away. It was fast. You just have to navigate a little bit, and um, you know you could find the particle. For example, the example that I showed you, the first one that we ended up publishing in Nature Materials, that one uh, wasn't uh, that difficult to find. Yeah. We argued because they ended up finding uh, the area with the boundary. So that where the lag part uh, came in. Um, but you know, like I guess in low dose in uh, low magnification, you know, normally you it's easier to achieve these low dose conditions, and you should be able to find uh, perhaps you should be able to find certain structure um, in low dose conditions. Some people, uh, even looking at the image, can tell if the sample is on zone, even in uh, low magnification mode. So, well, let me ask you a question now. That we're thinking, how do you, if you're doing it in that fashion, how do you know? When you switch from diffraction to imaging mode, how do you know that you're in focus? How do you know you're at Schertzer? Or how do you, I guess you don't know that, but how do you, how do you try to in, ensure? Well, I mean, even if you're in all those conditions, you're still getting an FFT, you can still see the information. So from there, uh, you could tell. Okay, so you, so even though you, so you quickly switch out of diffraction, look at the FFT, try to make sure you bring it to focus and then acquire the image. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but I think I think we understand there'll be a lot of effort to try to find a good particle. But if if we could practice setting up the right conditions and making sure that we understand how to use the the camera in that way, I think that would be very beneficial for. Uh, yeah, it, it it's also key to have the microscope uh, perfectly aligned. Yeah. I mean, not, not by you, by the uh, in your case by the the FBI engineer, because when you want to when you change the magnification and make sure the illumination stays constant. You don't want to change the magnification. All of a sudden, the illumination uh, changes. So you want to make sure the illumination with respect to the detector stays the same. Oh, you know, the beam is spread in the same way. The beam doesn't shift. Right. So that's what you have to make sure. And these are actually uh, key conditions, you know, when uh, in the case of um, um, cryo EM, because you know you go from uh, extremely low magnification mode to higher magnification. Sure. Yeah, oddly, we're in the most conservative condition you can be in because every time you change magnification, the beam blinks. Uh, I'm not sure what condition that is, but um, so that was no, uh, that was that was our issue today. Uh, I mean, that's kind of not that's not a problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you have the beam is illuminating a certain area, you want to make sure the beam stays in the same area, and um, when you change magnification, doesn't move or doesn't change in size. Agreed. 
I'm and sorry. Just, I, I made a bad. I made a bad joke. <laughs> but yes, we. Uh, you don't want any beam shift or beam displacement when you change magnification or spot sizes or. or um, yeah, these are actually key in the in the case of. Uh, um, the Creos. Uh, no, no. I mean, in general, for uh, low dose imaging. Okay. Well. To the guests that are still remaining, I ask one last time, are there any other questions? I don't see any, so. Um, any, any survivors? Yeah, we have, there, there's a 10 or 15, so. Um, well, I, Paolo, I wanna extend my thanks to you. Um, it's been beneficial last night and today working with you and going over this. Um, I think we will take you up on your offer if there's an option here in the future. Um, and as you know, there's an, a standing offer for you to, uh, Use our systems or experiment with them when you want. So. Oh, I mean, I would love, I would love to. I mean, I would love to come and visit you again. It's just, uh, you know, when I, when I'm able to travel again, you know, yeah. I'll definitely come to Ohio State. We can run some experiments together. Okay, that's great. And I know, and like Dave has quite a few students that are pushing this, and there's a few new professors and new projects, and so we. Uh, we're going to start using the K2 much more. So uh, yeah, I'm actually I'm actually very much interested in, uh, and I think some people are already moving in that direction to do some uh, atomic kills on uh, MOF. Yep. And um, I think it's is possible, and uh, there are some um, we there are some labs in the world already moving towards that direction, um, and they're going to be trying to do some uh, atomic kills on uh, on MOF to see different. Uh, the position of different metals. Um, yeah, that's one aspect. Um, you know, they're trying. They're trying to do, um, and you know, we're going to try to do the same. I think that would be really impressive, with my limited exposure to MOFs and seeing how beam sensitive they are. That that would be a huge success. So. Oh, I I, ju I just got a question from uh, uh, Dave. Any comment on cryo older developments for uh, for atomic yields? So we have uh, the the else older the six nine eight. Um, so that is a single tilt at the moment, uh, but we're working on that is actually pre uh, pre stable. Um, I mean, if you look at the uh, the results that uh, we are getting uh, um, in terms of drift, uh, it's it's pretty stable. In, uh, in general, it's uh, it's a little bit difficult to build. Uh, detectors for uh, Femmo Fisher instruments because the road is very thin. So, um, but in the case of the new design, it's actually we're getting a much better uh, resolution compared to, uh, you know, the previous, uh, the previous solder. Also, the sites of the, the duet is like a circular sites. Uh, sorry, that the duet is made of the different materials so where uh, the bubbling is not needed anymore. I mean, the previous version. Now uh, we have to do. You have to debubble uh, um, your uh, old uh, your uh, the doer. Um, but now we, we change the material, so that doesn't. Um, that's not something that we do anymore. The old time is like eight hours. So I believe once we're able uh, to have the L solder double tilt, I think it's going to be like really really good for atomic yields in cryo conditions. That was going to be my next point was we need a cryo condition probably to do atomic eels on moss. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so you, the, the double it, tilt that will be available. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I don't know. I don't know about that. I can ask you not. You guys are not the only one asking this question when it's uh, uh, when it's ready. Um, but, um, I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, the product manager of uh, Holder when uh, when is uh, when is ready. Um, I don't know if he has some prototypes, but there, there are uh, people like a Cornell who actually asked. Uh, I mean, we promised them like a long time. I think we promised them at the age meeting in Japan, which was like nearly four years ago now. Um, yeah, I think David was there when uh, Alina from uh, uh, from Cornell showed some uh, atomic kill data with the K2, and I uh, was complaining a lot about the stability of the older. Now we talked about uh, you know the new older, but we haven't even been able uh, to get the double tilt, uh, the double tilt version. So 
I don't think we are too far. I just uh, don't have any timeline um, to share with you at the moment. But uh, I'll definitely let you know. Any other questions? I think that's it. The participants are dropping off. Oh, no more survivors. Yeah, we have, we have about six. We have, we have five survivors or six survivors. So, um, okay. So if there are no more, Dave going once, going twice. Okay. Well, Paolo, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. We appreciate your time. Oh, thanks. I think it went pretty smooth. But thanks also for uh, for giving us the, the microscope. I mean, certainly, for, uh, certainly. I I have to agree. I mean, you you control it very well from California while we're in Ohio. So. <laughs>